Okay, chapter 15 is on presidential systems. This is a follow-up to chapter 14 on parliamentary systems. Presidential systems, you're more than likely to be more familiar with them if you've been raised in the U.S. political system. Presidential systems, the legislature and the executive is are elected independently of each other. We looked at that little uh, flow chart in the previous chapter to show primary differences there, and they are not forced into cooperation, whereas in the parliamentary system, the majority party creates a cabinet and has pretty much unopposed control over passing the polo policies that they were elected to uh, pursue. The president is elected by all of the voters in the U.S. The only office in the United States that's elected by all the voters. That's one of the reasons why the presidential election gets so much attention. The cabinet is appointed by the president, has to be approved by the Senate, but they operate separately and independently of the legislative branch of Congress. Congress is synonymous with a parliament in another country. It is the legislative lawmaking body. The Congress has its own separate elections, and these elections are in the single member districts that we talked about before. There's one representative elected from each of the congressional districts. New Jersey has 12 of them, for example. And then the states elect two senators to go to the Senate. So what we have here in the United States is a bicameral system. House of Representatives, and the Senate. The framers of our Constitution did that for a couple of reasons. They wanted the, the Congress to be the predominantly more important branch because it's making the laws, but they did not want it to get too powerful, so they split it up into two houses. And another reason why they did that was the Great Compromise during the Constitutional Convention because the small states were worried that they would not get enough re representation if it was just based on population. So they created the Senate, the Senate, which has two representatives for every state, regardless how big or small your state is. And in the, as we'll see here in a minute, the Congress, the bulk of the work is done by its committees. The committees do the, uh, the detailed work behind the scenes for the most part and they refer the bills out to the floor of the House for debate. Here's another map showing presidential systems around the world in blue, United States, predominantly South America. Quite a few of the African states have presidential systems. Now, of course, this is somewhat differing from the, the uh, map we saw the other day because some presidential systems are not considered democracies, more of authoritarian systems. The uh, other countries with the uh, yellow and the orange, these are somewhat hybrid type systems, but the, uh, excuse me, the yellow are semi-presidential systems that we've talked about before. Again, we'll be focusing mainly on the United States presidential system. We have the executive branch, which is overseen by the president. The reason why it's called a presidential system is because the president has considerable power. It may, may a lot of it be uh, symbolic, that uh, he may have limitations and constraints and checks on his power, but it still kind of centers around the president. So here's our three branches that are working off of each other through their separation of powers, the legislature, which is Congress, and our court system, and the federal system is made up of the Supreme Court and the lower federal appeals courts and district courts. As I said, the leadership in the presidential systems, as, as to why it's called that, there's considerable focus on the president and the national election of the president. More than a year of intense scrutiny of the candidates, weeding them down to two candidates and just enormous publicity, attention, campaigning, fundraising in order to elect 
the President of our United States. There is some debate on whether or not that's too much, but the uh, President is incredibly important position and potentially the most powerful human being on the face of the earth because of what he has or she has at the at her fingertips as far as being commander in chief the president is considered not only the head of government but the head of state as the moral leader and the symbol of our country the face of our country in other words because the president represents the United States in our foreign affairs. That's very much implied in the Constitution that the foreign policy will be under the direction of the president. He's also the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. The president also appoints cabinet officials and department heads of all the executive agencies, and part of his controlling this huge executive branch, which has, which has over 2 million employees, he needs to appoint officials that are going to be loyal to his agenda. What was he elected to do? Now, according to the U.S. Constitution, the president has several expressed powers. These are expressed. They are written in the Constitution. He is the chief executive, which means his branch is responsible for executing the laws which means that Congress makes the laws and then they pass it over to the president's branch to execute or implement and enforce those laws. He sets the national agenda because he's the only person that's elected by the entire country. So his proposals, his policies, his ideas as to what he wants to do for the future of this country is supposedly what he got elected on so therefore he gets up in front of the country and the congress in the state of the union address and says okay this is what the country elected me to do so now congress get to it pass these laws that i will sign commander in chief however he cannot declare war war has to be declared by congress congress has not declared war since world war ii so we'll get into a little bit of that complications here in a minute. But once he's been designated to engage in this problem, which could result in some conflict or mobilization of troops, he has the power to direct that war. As we've already talked about, the president appoints all of the department heads, all the cabinet level officials, all those cabinet secretaries. He appoints all the judges. The judges are appointed for life, so they do not come up every term. But when a judge either steps down or resigns or dies, the president appoints all the federal judges. He also appoints all the ambassadors to the foreign countries because of his face of the nation status as the, the chief diplomat or the representative to the country, to the other countries as the face of the United States. As a part of this foreign policy power, he negotiates the treaties, or his representatives do, such as the Secretary of State or the ambassadors, or even special envoys that are sent to negotiate very important treaties that are affecting the world's future. And, uh, of course, the check on this power here is that the treaties have to be approved by the Senate by a two-thirds vote. The president also has the power to veto a bill that's been passed by Congress. So that's why there's various major checks and balances on these three branches of government, which makes policy making very deliberative and very hard in general because all, everybody has to kind of come together. And so therefore we end up with a lot of cooperation and co uh, compromise and perhaps even just incremental policies in order to get everybody on board for it to be passed. Now, the president's power has expanded over the uh, past many decades. This is probably more than what the framers of our Constitution intended, but these are very practical reasons, and many of these reasons are, is because Congress or the courts have literally okayed or allowed these additional powers. One, of course, is 
a little bit more military power because of blanket resolutions that are given to the president by Congress, such as the problem in Vietnam. That did not start out as a war. The Congress gave the president the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which was essentially a blank check for the president to take care of that problem by any means necessary. The wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were not declared by Congress. They were authorized by Congress for the president to go take care of that problem, particularly terrorism in the Afghanistan region. And these are called authorizations to use military force, to use any and all appropriate necessary force to take care of that problem. And as we've seen, even though Congress has not declared war, the president has been given this responsibility and it eventually escalates to war. So that's how we can explain that. Now, the diplomatic power that the president has gained over the years are called executive agreements. These are very practical agreements for the president to negotiate with a country or with a smaller group of countries. Treaties are typically global. So executive agreements are not the same as global treaties. These executive agreements give the president a little bit more flexibility and leeway and leverage and the ability for him to be credible to these other countries that, yes, this agreement is good and it's not going to be undermined by the Senate when I take it back for them to approve it. Because that happens, that has happened quite a bit in our history where the president has negotiated a very big treaty and it was turned down by the Senate. So therefore, these executive agreements have evolved over time and have been held up by the Supreme Court or upheld by the Supreme Court so that the president has this power to make these executive agreements with other countries and they have the same effect as a treaty with those countries, but they do not have to be approved by the Senate. So that's another expansive power. In addition, the president has the power to pass or to literally just decree executive orders. These dictate rules or requirements over government employees. So therefore, these executive orders apply only to the executive branch. However, they could also apply to the contractors to the executive branch. So that could branch out to several million people. So the president could be questioned as perhaps over use of power within executive order. And sometimes they do go to the Supreme Court and they sometimes have been shot down. But they do have the force of law particularly with the executive branch employees. So that gives the power, a little bit more power to the president. So these are explain some of the expanded powers of the president. Now the parties in the presidential systems are more, more loosely uh, unified. We do know that in the proportional representation systems and the parliament center systems, it's all about the party. The party, you're voting for a party and the party controls government. Here in the presidential assess, uh, systems, it's less of a farm system for advancement. As we've seen just in this past election, the candidates for president of the United States, uh, the candidate for the Republican Party, Donald Trump, prior to a couple of years ago, he was not a member of the Republican Party. He had changed party uh, affiliations several times prior to that. And then on the other side of the coin, a candidate for the Democratic Party's nomination, Bernie Sanders, was not a member of the Democratic Party up until recently. He had been an independent, socialist-leaning politician. So therefore, you see in the, in the American presidential system, we are much more susceptible to have an a individual fig, figure come out to be a president, even though he does have to declare membership to the party to get elected, essentially, they are not necessarily part, party centric, as we see right here. Voting is less part, party centric. Again, the the party of the president may have less likely to be controlling the legislature. We've seen that quite a bit in the last few years, where the Republican Party controls Congress and the Democratic Party controls the president's office. So we have what is called a divided government. It's a little bit more difficult to get legislative legislation passed is not necessarily a bad thing because with a divided government, you may have more 
dip, uh, I guess you could say deliberative legislation that makes it through, perhaps more incremental, more compromise necessary, more thought out policy, certainly not a bad thing, but of course it may take longer and in some cases nothing may happen. So that's a kind of get good, good and bad with that. In the multi-party systems, the uh, particularly in the uh, where you have a coalition, which is mostly in the in the parliamentary systems, the parties serve as that weak glue for the formal coalition that rules government. Less likely in a two-party system, particularly in a in our presidential system in America. The path of U.S. policy. We talked about how that's done in the parliament, whereas the cabinet pretty much controls it all. Here it's much more of a long path and much more deliberative. The, in the Congress, we have two houses, and the bills are shaped by the committees. We have several standing committees. We've got about 15 to 20 standing committees in each of the houses. The uh, health care policy bill is, is put into a, a health care committee, and they shape it. They hammer it out. They get the final form out so that it gets out to the floor, and there on the floor it's debated, amended, and then eventually would have to be approved by both houses. And then each of those versions has to go to what they call a conference committee to put into a final version that's approved by both of the houses. So that takes quite a bit of time and effort to just to get a final version approved by both houses. Then it goes to the president. The president can sign that bill into law or he can veto it. The president does not veto that many bills because there's always that signaling going back and forth between the president and the Congress. The president will say, well, if you give me that bill the way it's written now, I am going to veto it. So therefore, the Congress gets that signal. They get that message and they go back and they perhaps rework it or add something to it or take something out of it because they, just like anybody else, don't want to go through all that effort to put something together and then the president to veto it. So Again, you've got that signaling, that iron triangle of policy making working all the time so that hopefully that when the Congress gets the bill, final version approved by both of the houses, they send it to the president, the president signs it. If he does veto it, Congress does have a provision in the Constitution that if it's a very popular policy, that they can override that veto with two-thirds vote in both houses. This does not happen very often. So let's look at some comparisons here. In the presidential systems, we've already talked about how the final responsibility is less identifiable. The president can blame Congress. The Congress can blame the president. They can let the courts handle it with a, with a decision or a ruling that could strike down a law. So a lot of, lot of finger pointing and potential for things not to get done in this uh, separation of powers presidential system. The parties are more fragmented in the uh, presidential system. We've got a very severe polarization between the two parties. Right now, it's to where they are gridlocked most of the time. The approval ratings of Congress are at all-time lows because of this, this polarization and this partisanship to where the parties are less able to work together, less able to compromise to get uh, bills out. We've already discovered that in the parliamentary system, the ruling parley, party or the ruling coalition has total control. The opposition really doesn't have much power to do anything other than provide some lively debate and hopefully persuade the majority coalition into wording the bills to their favor or perhaps adding some amendments to the bill. So therefore, in the presidential system, comprehensive policy is more difficult. And we can also see that minority-driven policy often prevails. And we've already talked about this, particularly in the case of interest groups. In the pluralist system of America, where interest groups are driving the policy for the most part, a very vocal or a powerful interest group that does not represent a majority of American interests could certainly hammer, get policy hammered through 
through lobbying, which we've talked about, campaign contributions, assisting congressmen, advertising campaigns, just because of the fact that they are more committed and more vocal about their policy. We also know that in the Senate, the minority party has the power to filibuster, so that often prevents policy that a majority of the country may favor, but the minority party in the Senate is preventing it from happening. So we see lots of potential problems with our system that are certainly worth you guys getting smarter, getting out there, perhaps fi fixing some of these problems. Also in presidential systems, the leaders typically do not emer uh, emerge from careers in parliament. Presidents can come from anywhere. We've got, as we've even seen in this time, we've got a, a uh, private businessman, president of the United States. We also see in the presidential American system that governors in our federal system are all quite often very attractive candidates. George W. Bush was a governor. Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter was a governor. We've seen uh, here in recent history, governors are attractive candidates for president because they've actually been the administrators of a very large governmental system. And so therefore, they are perhaps more attractive or more suited to stepping up and being the administrator of another yet larger governing system. The president is somewhat more isolated from Congress, obviously because of these checks and balances and separation of powers, and obviously the legislature is not under his control. However, he does have the power to sign those bills. He does try to set the agenda. So it's, uh, again, the separation of powers, checks and balances are making policy making more deliberative as well as more difficult with this separated system. So therefore, with the presidential systems, you have less flexibility of the political process. The president has fixed terms. He also, we have a need for a vice president in our system in order, because the importance and the power of the president, the void cannot be there, whereas in the parliament, they can adapt, they can adjust, the prime minister can come out of the majority party, you're, you're actually voting for the party. You're not voting for the prime minister. The prime minister comes out of that ruling coalition. So we have more ability to adjust and adapt, more flexibility in the parliament. The cabinet, once there has been a loss of confidence, the cabinet can be ousted. That does not happen in our presidential system. The uh, Once they're appointed, they're there for the entire term of the president unless they want to step down and the president would then appoint another one. So we've seen some pretty major, major differences between the parliamentary system and our presidential slash congressional system in the U.S. So what we have here is uh, some areas where they're trying to provide mixed systems. We've talked a little bit about that before with the consensus parliaments in uh so <clears throat> mixed systems where the divided interests make coalitions more difficult for a parliament. We see that France, Italy, and the former communist systems had developed hybrid presidential systems. They are still showing mixed results. And in some of the third world countries, and we've talked about third world as another word for poor countries or developing countries, they have uh, started to shift a little bit more to executive leadership, as we saw on that map. Considerable third world countries or uh, least developed countries, such as in Africa, have found the presidential systems more attractive, the, and these presidential systems can therefore become more potentially more authoritarian. 